Welcome, welcome, welcome back to yet another episode of, of the Corporate Ladder Series that we are building on, as you can see. But as always, welcome to the Premium Cage Podcast, where we lock into a free state of mind each and every pay week on all DSPs, of course. And to my right, as always, I got my main guy, my ace, my left, my right as week, Sean, better known as the Senor Lee on all your socials. You know. Yeah, hey, better known as Hey Cat, looking on all socials. And we had the pleasure of actually bringing back the same lovely ladies from the part one series. We're going to start off with Mimi, uh, <clears throat> Miriam Jimenez, uh, to the corporate world, as you may know. And we also have Miss Aisha Ortiz again joining us. How you doing, ladies? Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for having us. As you know, over here on part two of the Climbing the Corporate Ladder series, we are going to jump into the MedTech Careerist. If you haven't seen as of yet, um, I don't know what, I mean, Sean, talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, definitely. Um, if you haven't checked out part one, this is part two of our Climbing the Corporate Ladder at the mid-tier careerist, the first one was the early careerist. So just to level set everything, if you just happen to catch us on part two, I'm just gonna have Miriam and Aisha introduce themselves and what they do professionally. So I'm gonna start with Miriam. Hello everyone, thank you for having us again. Um, I'm Miriam Jimenez and I am a credit card market manager for Chase Bank. I've been with them for 16 years, um, climbed that corporate ladder um, as well as I've been a part of other corporations before that. Thank you, Miriam Aisha. Yep, I'm Aisha Ortiz. Right now, I am a HR business partner, also with Chase. Um, and I also have my own career coaching consulting firm where I work with young to mid-level um, professionals, just helping them navigate their job seeker journey all the way to their new hire journey and working with um, corporations. But I have worked for small and large businesses, different industries. So I've definitely gained some experience over the years. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And if you want to know anything more about them, you got to go back to part one. You can't just skip and learn more about them. Right. Or you can wait, one. watch it all. Exactly. Right. Or you can watch it all the way through the end where they'll be sharing their contact information and you could probably get some one in one time. I don't know. It took us a while to get on their schedule. So I don't know if y'all going to get that lucky, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah. That's fire. <laughs> if you had the opportunity of catching the first part, uh, we, as, you, as Sean mentioned earlier, we spoke about the early careers. But for this one, now we hope you know uh, you got your you got your foot in the door. You actually got the job at this point. You know what I mean? You got you know, you know you know where the good food spots are in the area, but you're not here for that. You're here to see if this is something that you truly need to keep doing if you're on the right path. Or so you're really at this point, you're kind of deciding what's next for your career. If this is where you need to be, if it's where you need to keep going and pursuing. So I'm going to start off with you, Aisha, first on this one. Give mm -hmm. me uh, uh, two main factors that are guiding you in deciding your career path. Two main factors. One, you have to decide you've already established what you really like, um, but you need to be able to decide culture, company, and where you want to see yourself within the next few years, but also if that job and then if that um, company is actually fitting with your personal life outside of work. I think that's really something that's really pivotal. When you're early in your career, you have a lot more flexibility and freedom and enthusiasm to pour 100 a thousand percent into your job but once you're really approaching that mid-tier there's other things that are equally as important and request some of your time so really making sure that it's a whole culture fit not just your position but also the company um and if it allows you the flexibility to still be a person outside of work um so that really comes to knowing that your identity as a person is separate than your actual job title and finding beauty and value in both Ooh, gotcha gotcha um, it's, um should i before i jump should i jump to mimi yet you know i got a quick interjection before i jump to your mary i'm like okay. um a, a two main factors that i feel people might fall into a lot is uh it trying to be their true passion something they truly always want to do uh versus convenience i want to ask mm -hmm. you um uh, what were what are your two main factors as to why you are where you are today in your career 
Two biggest. One, I, I like what I do um, a lot overall. And also it provides me the flexibility that I show up in my personal life outside of work the way that I want to. So it allows me to have boundaries, but you know, with both. And that was something that was really key to me early on. Um, before I 100% dove into HR, I actually worked in retail and had an opportunity to go into retail management. And it was a pivotal point because I was like, I, I like my holidays <laughs> and I like, I like stability and I like consistency. And those were things that at that time, I, I wasn't a mom, I wasn't a wife, um, but at that time, those were things that were important to me. And I knew that they would be even more important as my career blossom and developed and as I got older. So that was really pivotal in me choosing to go right and go into HR. Um, and even as I grew my career in HR, it, it needed to be a company that I was proud of, um, right? And I didn't want it to be like, oh, you work for there, you know, because the company didn't really align with my values. So I think um, Make, making it more of a choice, like I'm choosing you as a company, whereas when you're early in your career, you're kind of in the pick me, pick me, like I'll I'll take whatever, you know, phase of your journey. But as a mid-tier worker, you're really looking at your employer differently. Very true, very true. And uh, Mary, how about you? What were your two factors? Um, So just to kind of piggyback off of what Aisha said, right? Um, It is a change in your mind and how you think of yourself. Um, because now you're getting to a point where you should feel more confident in what you have to offer and the value that you can add. So now this is more of a negotiating table, right? Rather than a pick me, pick me, right? But in order to have that confidence, you have to understand what do you bring to the table, right? So understand what are those skills? What are those personality traits? Um, and it's having that confidence in you. Um, I think another thing was learning to use my resources um, because I did, I wanted to be in the company I work for. I promise you Chase is not sponsoring this, right? <laughs> um, but um, I like the company uh, that I work for, right? But there were so many positions, right? And so many opportunities. And I needed to understand, like, if I went for this role, what am I actually doing? And I didn't know how to do that until I learned to use my resources, reaching out to people, right? Uh, asking someone that you do not know for a 15 minute Zoom, just so that they can explain to me, what is it you do? Because I think I want to be over there. Um, learning how to like look up those requisitions in HR, um, learning how to use like any development tools that they have that could prepare you for those next steps in that next role. Um, whether it be like some internet training for five minutes or an in-person class that they're holding for, uh, like I went to some leadership training, but definitely having confidence in yourself and then starting to learn how to use those resources. That's really what helped me like propel forward. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, it's funny. As far as a true passion versus convenience, like me personally, it worked out on my end because uh, architecture was something I kind of always wanted to do. So it would work out in that favor. Um, but then it ended up being convenient just because it was close to home. So I kind of had the best of both worlds <laughs> in that aspect. But uh, Sean, take us into the next one. Yes. So what I've learned, and both of you can, can pretty much guide me through this and see if this sounds familiar. The hard worker versus the true leader. So many times people are wondering about opportunities of upward movement. They may have just come into the company, probably been six months to a year in, and they're already asking, how do I move up? And one of the questions I always ask are, you know, are you the go-to person on your team or are you just the hardest working person on your team? Because there is a difference, especially if you're going to take on a role where you are going to be the one in charge making the decisions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you, Mimi. What are the differences in both of those traits to you? Um, so there was a line that I had to cross, right? So I started entry level, um, in which case you are part of a team, you're you're part of that like front line, so to say. And then I crossed over to management. 
Um, and one is understanding the difference between a manager and a leader, right? Um, because there are some roles where I guess cracking a whip is what I would call it. <laughs> Might be appropriate if you're in the military, maybe if you're part of a police force or something. Um, but a leader isn't someone who just cracks a whip. You know, a leader is going to be someone who can motivate their team to reach a common goal. And there's going to be different skill sets that you need in order to accomplish that, right? Um, and understanding what's of those skill sets that you have, and um, maybe you can work on uh, just getting better or some skill sets that maybe you don't have, right? And like, how do you learn how to, uh, uh, you know, execute on those different skills that you don't have? So there's definitely a lot of self-reflection, a lot of uh, re assessing yourself. And I think that's one of the key things too, is understanding that it's a lot of you and bringing your best self to the table because you're, you can only control really your actions. So how do I bring my best self to the table so that then I can have this team reach this common goal, whatever that may be. Um, and if you cannot like self-reflect, be flexible, understand your team, understand, like have that emotional intelligence, understand the difference between uh, being quick and being efficient, um, understanding how to communicate with your team, let them know um, you know, what are the expectations? What are our resources to get there? You know, and just be helpful and care. Like I'm here to help you reach that next step. I'm here to help you be better in the position that you're in now. Um, it, it, you, if you can't understand that you're going to be a manager and not a leader. Uh, so it's a lot of like self-reflecting and bringing your best self to the table. Miriam, man, see, this, this, this is why I love you. The fact that you're <laughs> on here, man, like this, cause I, I, I wish that we could package that. Oh yeah, we are. We're recording this, right? That's the beautiful <laughs> thing about this. <laughs> shameless plug, shameless plug, right? Um, but beautifully said, and I think that is going to resonate with so much of our listeners. Now, Aisha, as I transition to you, mm -hmm. with everything that Miriam just said about the characteristics, the work ethic, the vision, crossing the line, the emotional intelligence, how does this show up in the interview process and what key tips could you give someone to kind of try to maneuver that into the interview interview process if it's really something that is in them yeah absolutely i think it shows up in different ways one of the key things is taking the initiative and in the examples that you're providing in the interview to really showcase what you've done and what you're capable and why you would thrive in that role is are you aligning those examples to tactical work or strategic work because along with the mindset of crossing the bridge from you know being a member of the team and actually leading the team, a lot of it is, are you aligning yourself with a lot of the tactical administrative things or are you showcasing examples where you're really a thought leader, where you really were able to look at something strategically and provide a solution and what the impact of that solution was? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I have an example of that actually. So um, I remember, so in a bank, we deal with money, right? And um, we have certain things that are in place uh, to make sure that there's no theft and that, you know, our assets are protected and, you know, to minimize like risk. And they give us a guide, right? So they give us policies, they give us a uh, um, different checklists, they give us different, um, you know, resources, support lines and things like that so that you can execute on that process, right? Now, in this in this example, my employee um, followed the book, right? Fo followed everything down to the T, right? But then ended up in a situation where it was kind of like, okay, well, this isn't too clear in policy. Um, and what they did was they made a choice that was kind of like, okay, well, this is the easy way to do it. Um, and we sat down and we reviewed it, right? Like, okay, so you had everything sp spelled out, but when you got to this moment, right, did you really understand the why behind 
all of those policies being there, right? Did you really assess the risk of those steps that you were taking? Like, is it going to protect the asset or is it going to leave the door open for some internal theft or something like that? Did you put yourself first because you just wanted to get the situation out of the way? Or did you really understand what was the essence of all of these policies and then continue that through this decision that you had to make, right? So in one, in what they did was they were just a uh, order taker and uh, checking everything off of the list rather than being that innovator, right? And understanding that this is, this is where my leadership comes into play, where I have to really take a look at this, gather all my information and make an informed decision so that I can continue that protection of the asset through this process. And that, that's kind of like a difference between like, are you just an order taker or are you a leader? And a leader doesn't always mean there. I have a ton of people that directly report into me. Like in that moment, I I was leading into the moment. And even in my in working with a lot of different companies, you have senior leaders with very like highly compensated and executive titles, and they have no direct reports. But they're a leader in what they do, and they're a strategic go to person. They're not the person planning the baby showers. They're not the person getting the card for, you know, Susan's retirement. They're the ones that they go to where they're like, we we need your insight to guide us out of this. Excellent. That's actually perfect. And I always lean on the book, uh, The Leader Without a Title by Robin Sharma. It's a perfect, perfect example of how you can be a leader without having direct reports or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got a I got a question for both of you actually. Uh, when you had your jobs, you know, uh, it might just be from the cloth that we are uh, right before the millennial kicked off. We are we are just naturally hard workers. It was just a habit. We didn't know how not to work hard. That's what we're showing up to work for. But um, hard work over time it builds it builds it builds. People start to rely on you. You start to mentor without you noticing you're mentoring. But then you transition into being that leader. Do you recall that moment when you're like, oh, sweat? Like, when did I got to check my pay stub? I don't think I've been getting paid <laughs> for this new role that I've uh, obtained. Do you recall the moment in your career when that transitioned? And then how long did it take for you to realize I went from hard work at a leader, but the hard work didn't really stop? Now I'm kind of doing both. <laughs> I'm going to start with you, Aisha. Yeah. So for me, I'm. I remember um, I was actually in a recruitment position and I just organically started taking on additional responsibilities. I I like to call it like fix it Felix. So if I see a problem and I'm very opinionated and I'm like, why are we doing it this way? Like this doesn't work. Why don't we do it this way? And like look at the impact and how the improvement. So that's kind of where like that hard worker came in and me just wanting to make things better and improve it. And that's where I really started to see the shift, not only in terms of my mindset, because I I was confident in my skill set and my experience and what I was saying and recommending and knew what the outcome would be that I wasn't like, I think we should. It was like, this this is what I'm proposing. Like, here's the business case. I've already tested it. How do we expand it um, so everybody else is doing it this way? Not to be like bossy, but I just saw that there was a huge gap or there was a need for a process improvement. And when I started doing more of that and people were giving me the leeway to do that because they too then started believing in me and having confidence in me, that's where the light bulb went off um, and kind of confirmed that I could do more than just recruiting and I could go into a business partner type of role, but now my paycheck should also catch up. And maybe I shouldn't just be a regular recruiter, maybe I should be a senior recruiter. So I started ha being more confident and having those conversations. Yeah, I think confidence is the key there. As um, soon as you know your job without you having to look up what your job is, mm -hmm. that's when it starts to kick in. That's when you go, listen, listen, I know where you're about to go. You, as soon as you can see someone going the wrong way early, and you pull them back in, draw them back to the drawing board, so I know what you're thinking, but you're wrong. This is what we got to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the best part of work for me personally. It's uh, just knowing what you're doing without, it's just, it just rolls off of you at this point. It's not even research. It's nothing you're working about. It's just life now at this point. Yeah. And it's the and it's the trust from leadership too. I, I've seen that happen when people finally trust in the people that they assign as leaders. 
um they're not trying to undercut you they're not micromanaging I, i've seen people really flourish when you've kind of let them flow on their own mm -hmm. yeah and, uh, and working off the undercut uh you just said there uh as you grow <laughs> in your mid tier you built you, in the earliest part of your life you might have built some some uh, built some great bridges you know what i mean but you might have found out your bridge was going to a higher level than somebody else's not that you had to burn that bridge but you had to move on from it mm -hmm. do you, i'm gonna start with you mary do you recall a bridge you had to burn unfortunately because it hindered you so <laughs> <laughs> I do, but I wouldn't necessarily call it burning a bridge because if there's one thing I learned is that you never know who you're talking to or who you're going to run into later on. Um, so what I have learned is that you have to be able to identify what is the value that this particular relationship gives to me or this uh particular particular connection um and be able to utilize that connection for that value that you're getting out of it right um so i oftentimes um tell my kids this right uh because growing up you always had to have a best friend right this is my best friend this is my best friend i do everything with this best friend and then you know god forbid your best friend and you have a difference of opinion and your whole world is going to like shatter um <laughs> So I tell my kids, you know, your friends cannot be your everything all the time and you cannot be someone's everything all the time either. And this is why you want to make sure that you have like several friends or diverse friends. You can't put all your eggs in that basket. But that friendship did develop because there was something that you got out of it at one time just because right now your opinions don't match doesn't mean that the friendship is completely over. You just have to understand that, you know, you can't bring your friends that you go to the club with home, like, you know, <laughs> like, so I wouldn't necessarily, Why not? <laughs> you know, I wouldn't necessarily call it burning bridges, but I did have to understand that there were certain things where I got value, certain things that just suck, you know, the energy out of me and kind of put everything in their position and, you know, know when to use it and when was the appropriate time to use it or make that phone call or reach out. Perfect, perfect. But I'm never gonna, burn a bridge because you never know when it's going to come back. I wanted you to lay the groundwork for what to do for burning bridges. And I was I was hoping you was quick enough to go, don't burn them. You might you know, go with right. a flame a little bit, but never burn them all. Hey, I had a manager who, need, who was looking for a new position, went on the interview, came back, and his manager was like, oh, you went on this interview, didn't you? Right? Mm -hmm. And he was ready to, like, you know, flip the bird walk out the door and all this stuff not realizing that hey those two people knew each other so all the information <laughs> got back to the person who just interviewed you oh wow it's the same to didn't get the position oh, and, and that's different institutions yeah and i will say even though now i'm with chase there was about an eight year gap before i rejoined chase last year so if i would have burned my bridge when i left them i wouldn't be i wouldn't have this wonderful opportunity that i currently have now so even if you realize that a, a particular employer they're just going to be your employer for a season it's not the end you never know what renovation or like what reiteration that employer will go through and may have opportunities that may attract you or interest you down the line. So you always have to part ways, whether it's professional relationships or actually employers, professional. Even if you got to bite your tongue, grind, <laughs> grind your teeth, you stay professional um, when you park that ways because you never know when you're going to reconnect in a different way. Absolutely. Now that I know the bad parts of burning bridges, what are some key tips that you can share with everybody on what you can do to not only gain those uh, connections, but to foster them to make sure they grow into fruitful ones for not only yourself, but hopefully for them as well? Uh, Go ahead, Aisha. I think a key part um, when we often look at networking, we look at it from the view of what can I get out of this? What opportunity will this lead? will this connect me to, um, whether it's a job or introduction, but the part that we often forget is what are we bringing to the network, right? It's a relationship and nobody wants to engage in a one-sided relationship. Like, I think we all have that friend that where you know, like you see them calling, you're like, 
this girl's going to ask for something or this person's going <laughs> to ask for something. And if you approach networking that way, it's not going to yield the return or the results that you really um, want it to. And then you say like networking doesn't work. Um, so really think of it as what can I bring to this relationship? Um, a lot when it comes into business, even if you're interviewing and you don't get the job, you could still stay connected to that recruiter, that interviewer, or, hey, we mentioned this during the interview. I saw this article, thought of you. Let me know what you thought. What you thought. You're reaching out not to say, got any jobs. You're reaching out to say, like, hey, like I'm, I'm nurturing this relationship. I'm thinking of you in that way. And that's where you're going to get that return. Gotcha, gotcha. How about you, Maria? Um, so I think being helpful, right? Because ultimately, at the end, when it comes to that networking, right, we're we're just trying to come together to accomplish that goal, whether it be the progression in my career or whether it be just um, expanding my brand, letting people know who I am. Um, uh, man, but uh, picking up where we left off, um, I know uh, there's a few tips as far as how to keep the bridges good, how to make them grow, how to make sure, you know, long story short, when you do need them, they are beneficial for you. But uh, as Aisha was saying earlier, making sure you bring something to the table as well. So in the event they need you before you need them, be ready in the event to help them out as well, whether maybe pulling their hand up or it, making an introduction for them that they may need to get themselves further to then pull you back up. But uh, yeah, networking and any positive tips that you guys can share and already have is always appreciated. We do appreciate that. But Mary, you got to let us know what you're thinking. Now I'm curious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. So when I approach networking, um, I always tell myself to be prepared to step out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, because it can include talking to someone new, participating in an event that maybe, you know, you've never done before, or you're going to be around some higher ups, but that's really the essence of the networking, right? Like I want to expand my network. I want to meet new people, but that's not going mm -hmm. to happen if you aren't willing to like feel a little bit of discomfort. It could be that very first handshake. You have to be that that person to give that first handshake, right? It could be that you walked, I, um, a few weeks ago, I walked into a room with all the higher ups in, in, in my new department and I did not recognize a face. And I had to take a deep breath and I had to say, you know what? Those people over there look like they're playing that game really well. I'm just going to sit down on that chair. And when they make a mistake, I'm going to laugh at it and interject into that conversation. Before you know it, they're all going to know who I am. Right. But you ha I had to like accept that discomfort and learn to like live in it a little bit just so that this way I can step out of my comfort zone and, you know, really get out there and, and, and network. Nice. Nice. Okay. Excellent. So now. We're going to go back to burning bridges, man, because uh -oh. I, I think um, we recently did, uh, I think it was a live, right, Kenny? Uh, yeah, it was a live. For that. Yeah. So we were talking about the rise since COVID of quiet quitting and loud quitting. Mm, yes. All right. So now, of course, you know, for those of you who don't know, quiet quitting is more so people are looking for jobs, mm -hmm. they're showing up, probably giving you the bare minimum. You got bare minimum Mondays. That term has taken over. And loud quitting is pretty much on social media. My job sucks. My boss don't know what they're doing. You've probably seen the memes when you're mm -hmm. trying to tell your boss something six months ago, and then when everything's on fire, you look like this. Um, so I, I just wanted to know if what do you both think about, and I'll start with you, Miriam. What do you think about these two terms, and do you feel like it started during COVID, or was this happening before? I think it was happening before but we like to give things terms and titles so that we can identify it, right? Um, I think that it was happening before, but I also think that the way it's being discussed now as if it's like an acceptable approach to your career or your you know, dissatisfaction with it is really a misconception. Um, Cause ultimately at the end, going back to burning bridges and networking and, and like building your brand, we talk like, you know, like um, when if I'm going to hire you or someone else is going to hire you, um, we're going to find out about you and perception is reality. 
And if you went from being, let's say, a top performer or uh, someone who was well known, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're not, uh, you're, you're passive, you're, you're just doing the bare minimum. Um, first, I'm going to check in with you, right? Because I want to make sure, again, there's that emotional intelligence part where I want to make sure there's not some sort of other personal obstacle, temporary obstacle. Is there something I can help you with? Is, are there resources I can give you? But once I determine that that's not what it is, and you're kind of just like, um, just someone who's being passive and not doing what they're supposed to do, you are now stuck with that perception. And, and that perception of you is going to be part of your brand, right? And mm -hmm. it's not going to be something that someone's going to forget either, because that means when the going got tough, you were not that go-to person, that reliable person. Again, it's going back to like that being part of a team, being a leader, you know, understanding that there's going to be good and bad and things cycle. Um, if that is your approach to it, like, I'm just going to throw my hands up in the air. Um, it's going to not only stick with you, it's going to be a hard hole to dig yourself out of, and it will spread like wire, wildfire. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. How about you, Aisha? I agree. Um, industries are small, right? So even if you take education or financial services, your brand says a lot about you. Um, and with the quiet quitting, agree. I think people were doing it for years and years. We just now have a, a title to call it by, but it's more a reflection of like your character, right? Um, there's been positions where maybe mentally I quiet quit, um, but I still have to show up. I still have to do the work until I find that next opportunity. So there, there are going to be seasons that call for you that aren't going to be the most enjoyable at your work. Um, and maybe those are opportunities for you to really self-reflect and say, hey, you know, is this the right fit for me? Um, if not, where can I find another opportunity either internally or externally before your dissatisfaction starts to seep through all the work that you're doing and really tarnishes your brand because people do talk. So even if you worked with another leader at one company and they move to another one or, you know, or you're applying externally to another company, they're going to be like, oh, you work at ABC company. I have a friend who works there. Let me see what I can find out. And I've seen that happen so many times, not only at large companies, but small businesses. And they're like, oh, that person is unreliable or this person, you know, and they speak about your brand. We're not going to move forward. I've seen that happen externally. I've also seen that happen internally. So it may look cute, to post on social media that you're quite quitting, but what's the long-term impact of you quite quit of you quite quitting? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I, I love it, and I think you both said it. Your reputation will make it into rooms that you haven't been in yet. And when you say that to people, and you see their eyes kind of get lost into the matrix, it's like almost like a red flag that maybe they're not ready because it or it's just them processing it could be either or but the message stays the same it, what, what you do here is going to translate into how people recognize you how they know your brand and how they know your work ethic so very good points and i also agree and me and kenny talked about this either on a live or on an episode where there's a lot of people who complain about the pizza party now don't get me wrong i don't think that Anybody should be rewarded for their hard work with a bunch of pizza. But I'll tell you one thing that I've never seen. I've never seen full boxes of pizza at any organization. So for every meme that somebody's making fun of it, when I walked past that lunch area and looked at them boxes, either there was one slice or it was carnage. It was straight carnage. There was napkins. Yeah, there was pepperoni slice pieces left, it was gone. So I, I, I don't get the meme because I, 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 I get the message behind it completely, right? Um, so listen, all really good points. So now we touched on this in the early careers part one, but we are back for more formal teaching as we walk into what? Mentorship. You are now a mid-tier careerist. You are probably aiming for or in a title that gives you direct reports, people who report to up to you, people who you are responsible for. 
And all of a sudden, your boss comes to you and says, hey, there is a mentorship program open. Now, of course, we always do our research here on Freedom Cage Podcast, and we're not going to leave you out there stranded. So what is a mentor? Well, we looked into do some research, and this is just a real formal um, definition. Mentor is an experience-driven guide whose role is to offer insights that help in the process of self-discovery, problem-solving, and growth. Whereas if you are the mentee, you are a goal-driven learner who is looking for a mentor to be a guide. Simple to the point. I'm going to start with you, Aisha. Do those definitions ring ring true with you? They absolutely ring true. One misconception I would say is that you don't have to be new in your career to be a mentee right so you can be a senior leader and still have room to be mentored by somebody um i see it a lot that really helps people continue to have a broader perspective sharpen skills help them have some self-reflection adjust any behaviors um so i would say you could be a mentee at all levels of your career, not just as a junior, I just graduated college or I'm still in college, but you can be an executive leader. I think they just call it like a coach, right? They may not be like, oh, my mentor. Um, They may refer to it as an executive coach. So it's something that is needed all throughout one's career. Absolutely. And you guys are lucky if you're here in part two, because she's giving you some clues into what part three is going to be about but we're not ready to give that to you yet. You got to come <laughs> back when we release part three. But yeah. Miriam, I'm going to go to you. What do you think about those two definitions? I think that those definitions um, lay out like what the goal of it is. Um, but, you know, another misconception is like, what does a mentorship look like? It doesn't have to be just a person. Um, so like at the institution that I work at, Chase, we also have what are called like mentorship groups. Um, and they may not even be called a mentorship group. It may be like uh, women on the move or something, right? So now it's like a group of women where we are all professionals um, and we come together and there's a, a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting or something. And they're coming from different areas of the company and we come together and we share, we have topics that we talk about. There's usually a leader and they're coming with these topics to just drive conversation, but we're sharing information, right? Some of us are in person, some of us are remote, some of us are um, married mothers, some of us are single mothers, some of us are not mothers at all. And it was focused around like being a woman, but it was a mentorship, right? Because it helped us to understand how we can navigate our career and personal life um, as women. Um, You know, I also participated in one where it was uh, based on being like Hispanic and Latino, right? And I ended up having people in my group that were like in South America, still same institution, but they were working in South America. So they have like other things that they, they, other concerns, right? That maybe it's not something that I face in my environment or my country or world but you know their approach is something that i can apply to when the type of obstacles i face over here so it doesn't have to be just a like one-on-one person there's different ways of finding mentorship and you know it's just wanting to go out there and and look for and take advantage of that i feel like we need to like input a picture here you know like when d wade is like this and then lebron is dunking it that's Aisha and Miriam in this conversation. Yeah. Like, we just we put an idea. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm definitely putting the graphic in somewhere. I'm you, I'm you. This, 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 is, this is going so good. I, I love it. So you talked about, you laid out a great foundation for the next um, section that I was going to, formal versus informal. And that's embedded in what both of you were talking about. So Miriam, I'm going to stay with you. Um, Tell us about the difference between formal and informal mentorship. Um, So formal and informal, I mean, ultimately at the end, are you getting the guidance 
for your goal, right? So formal can be something like participating in the groups that I mentioned or signing up for like a mentorship program at your institution or outside of your institution, right? Maybe it's not where you're working, but maybe where you went to school, they're offering a mentorship program. Um, those are typically going to be more structured. You know, there's probably going to be a, a periodic like laid out uh time schedule. They're probably going to have topics of conversation to discuss. Um, so that would be more formal. But you can also have informal ones, right? Um, you can have it. They could be family. It can be other professionals that maybe you're just meeting on the weekend to have a cup of coffee and you happen to talk about some professional topics right before you talk about the tea of the week, right? Um, you. It can also be uh, like maybe it doesn't have to be long term, right? Um, so an example is when I came into this role, I didn't really know what the role was, right? So I reached out, I literally went into phone book, looked up someone um, that was in the role, actually looked up a few, sent out some emails. Hey, my name is Mary. I'm interested in this. Would you be able to give me some guidance? Can I put a quick 15 minute Zoom call on your calendar? And someone actually responded, said, yes, of course. We and on for 15 minutes, I asked all those questions, you know, like, what is it that, you know, I could uh, like, what are some of the skills that this role is going to require? What is your day to day? Like, what's the day in the life of your role? Um, but I was able to ask those questions. That was quick, right? Wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. But in the those 15 minutes, that was a mentorship where they were giving me the guidance towards my goal. Mm. Uh, do you notice how sometimes informal mentoring um always has a better uh price point for you somehow like the, the <laughs> mentorship you wasn't looking for by accident is usually a, a good money bonus somehow some way like in the real corporate formal ones like don't get me wrong there's they're always great but the the accidents the run-ins the oh you're here at the same time oh you like your coffee from here oh let me put you in touch with such and such yes those, those are priceless i love when that happens i love it yes yeah, because mm -hmm. those are those are built from genuine care, mm -hmm. and, and, and and those bonds. Right? And we, it's it's crazy. Kenyon, we talk about this all the time. We literally talk, turn our everyday conversations into a show. So the other <laughs> the other live we did was about strong connections, right? And we used a beautiful analogy about you know our internet connections, and we felt like the strongest connection we could have is Ethernet, right? It's, it's once it's connected, it's strong. There's no dis, and even if there's distance when you come back together, it's like nothing ever happened, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you have the Wi-Fi, right? It's kind of shaky depending on where you're at. You know what I mean? It could be good, you could be bad, and then we don't want nothing to do with analog, right? Those are just there's, those are very out of tune. They're, you mentioned just not I can't believe you. <laughs> no dial-up friends. No dial-up yes. friends. Yes, yes, yes. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm still, hey, hey, I'm still uh, triggered by those AOL. Yeah, man. Like, <laughs> Still triggered by that. Still triggered by that. Um, but yeah, I I think you're right, Kenny. I think you hit it right on the right on the head, man. Um, a, a, any quick thoughts to add, Aisha? And then I'm gonna transition to one more question. No, I think the ones that happen organically and naturally, on the offset, like the person wants to see you win. You want to see that person win, right? Mm -hmm. So it's natural. There's a natural connection. There's a natural investment. Like I want the best for you, vice versa. I'm going to like, it's almost like having your height person, whether it's in the company or outside the company where they're like, mm -hmm. I got a person, this is my person where more formal ones, it takes some time to get to that level if it gets to that level. Mm -hmm. I think the ones that are more formal, it's a great networking. It's a great add on to be like, this is where I exhibited leadership opportunities because I love this. So it gives you a different type of return on the investment and a different outcome. Um, but I would say like both have some, both have value. If you're in a company look for those mentorship opportunities, whether it comes naturally through formalized programs, um, like the groups that Mimi mentioned, I'm actually in one tomorrow. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they're coming from business resource groups. So however you identify or want to be an ally to a particular group, that's kind of where you're finding your tribe and then ultimately finding your um, mentorship. I would also say, much like um, Mimi did, when she started a new position, if you're a new hire, look for a mentor. Ask, hey, 
I'm new on this role. Who should who are who are the top performers, or who should you who should I connect with to learn a special type of skill set? And that connection may not be one person, right? Like if your team does a lot of reporting, you might have to go to like Anita for reporting, but you may need to go to, you know, like Jose for something else and Aisha for something else. And it's almost like building up like your Avengers, right? Like building your village. And that's ultimately what mentorship is. You're not going to get everything from one person, but who are your point people to go to? It's great to have somebody internally because they can help you navigate, but it's also good to have somebody externally because they have an unbiased and broader perspective that will add value to you as well. Absolutely. So now I have a, I have a selfish question here. I am a Dedicated, dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I am a dedicated diversity advocate. And I think over the last couple of years, one of the biggest questions that we even asked on Lawrence, who we had on here, he's a director of experiential learning at Lehman College, uh, for anyone who hasn't checked out that episode, but you could after this. Um, he We asked him, what did he see being as being equity in mentorship. So when you hear that question, and I'm gonna start with you, Aisha, what, what, are you, what are your terms of understanding or perspective on true equity when designing a mentorship program? That's a weighted question. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy they gave it to you first. <laughs> so I have a, I have a lot of different answers for this one question. I think mentorship, a formalized mentorship, is something that is new to a lot of underrepresented communities. Um, so in that sense, I would say there isn't na naturally an equity piece, right? Because if I look at some of my non-Brown peers, they've had mentors and investors in their relationship, like from the time they played soccer at age three, right? Where I may just now be catching wind of it as a staffing coordinator. So they have, they've had years of mentorship when it came to picking the right college, guiding them in terms of what degree uh, or educational path to go through, right? Versus where maybe my guidance was, you're going to college, how we pay for it, we'll figure it out. What you do, who cares, as long as you have a degree. So that mentorship from that equity piece looks very different. Um, I think companies are now trying to catch up and offer a lot of very specific mentor programs to, um, to underrepresented groups. But some of the challenges are that a lot of the mentors don't necessarily look like the people who are being mentored. And mm. that's not always a bad thing, but it, does, it doesn't address the blind spot that that mentor may have, right? So if my mentor is, let's say, a white woman, I'm not a white woman. I don't identify as that. So some of the challenges that I may have as an African-American woman in corporate America may not even be on her radar because it's not mm -hmm. her experience. So she can help me navigate certain things and put my names into rooms and that's all great, but it's, but she has a blind spot when it comes to mentoring me because our experiences are so very different. Mary, mama. I'm gonna need you to Mariana Rivera this man. <laughs> what you, <got? laughs> you know, so I think when I think like from my own experience, um, there's definitely a gap, right? Um, one, I had no awareness of it, right? I didn't know it existed. It was this word that um you know, was like, is it, 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 that's what big people do. Like, you know, in the top, like they're, they're, there's, that's not something that I do where I'm at. Right. Um, so definitely depending where you come from, you may not even know that what a mentorship is or how it looks or, you know, the value that you can get out of it. Right. I think another part of that is, and, you know, coming from where I come from a pride and asking for help. Right. Um, we're not supposed to ask for help. Um, if you come from like low income areas, you come from the hood, right? You come from different like cultures, right? Asking for help is like, 
a sign of weakness, right? So there's another component to that. Like, I don't know what a mentorship is. And if it's me asking for help, I'm not even going to do it. I supp I'm supposed to be able to do this on my own. And then to Aisha's point, like, let's say I cross over to actually do the mentorship. I understand the value, but now who's my mentor going to be, right? Is it going to be someone who could relate to the things that um, I'm experiencing so that this way they can help me in maneuvering those things that I'm experiencing and overcoming the obstacles that I'm facing? Because if you can't understand it, right, how are you supposed to guide me through it? Um, so there's definitely a huge gap starting from just the awareness of it to like, what, what's there for me? Like, if I do want to take advantage of this. And I think that the way that we overcome that is where we have to be like really intentional in every decision and step that we make, including when like for when it comes to mentorship, who am I choosing as my mentor, right? Like mm -hmm. I want someone who's black or brown, right? I want someone who is a woman, if it can be someone who's uh, like, you know, a mom as well, that helps me uh, um, even more, right? So I'm intentional in the people that I want to be my mentor. I'm not just signing up, you know, just because I I, I, I heard it was the best thing to do on the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when we get to a point where you're in that entry level to now this mid-tier level where your decisions and, and what your next steps, you have to be intentional and strategic about it. And that's how we can overcome like those gaps with the mentorship. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That's the closer. That's the closer that right there. <laughs> All right. Um. Listen, it, it has been great. I mean, we're at part two. I, I feel bad. We're getting close to the end. I don't want it to stop. Like, I'm going to go rewatch all of this stuff. And, and hopefully all of you at home are, are feeling the same way. So some quick final thoughts before we close out. Miriam, I'm going to start with you. I think that when you're at this level, you're understanding that um, every step you take um, means something and has an impact and creates a perception about you, right? And therefore, you have to be strategic and intentional, you know, like I just said. Um, now you're not trying to get your foot in the door, but you have those two feet planted. So w which door is the next door that I'm going to open? Um, and if you don't really have that strategy behind it, you're going to waste a lot of time right? Because you're going to start doing things and putting and, and, and spreading yourself too thin and you're not going to see any results from that, right? So you're going to risk being discouraged or being unhappy where you are. So you have to be strategic, intentional, and understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, you know, and what those next steps are. Excellent. Aisha. Yep. I agree. Um, I'd say you also have to be this is your season of being selective, right? I think when you start your career, you don't feel as if you have the right to be selective because there's so much that you have to learn. Um, but you do have to be selective and you do have to align yourself with the right opportunities. And that's not necessarily the next big job or title, but in your current role, as you're looking to expand your responsibilities, are you expanding them for in the right direction? Um, there's a difference between working hard and working smarter. And there's a misconception that working smarter, you're not doing hard work. You are. You're laying the you're strategically laying down the foundation to get you to that next level. So like I said earlier, are you spending your extra time you know, hosting baby showers and retirement parties? Or are you, hey, I know you have this meeting with the senior leader. These are some talking points. These, This is a presentation that I did that's going to add value to that, that's creating an opportunity for you to get your foot into the next door. And um, like Mimi was talking about mentors, be selective. Don't just accept any mentor that comes your way, right? You have to be selective and understand what is the true value that I'm going to get out of this and treat every opportunity just that way. What is the true value that I'll get out of it that my future self is going to thank me for? Awesome. Awesome, man. Um, Sean, if you don't have nothing else to put on top of this, this whipped cream on top of this cake, you know what I mean? Like, I don't even Drop know what else. Wait, wait. 
Miriam, Aisha, from the bottom of our hearts, I just want to thank you guys so much for your time, uh, for all your input on the mid tier, as well as you did already way back when with the early career. Um, man, I have, uh, if I had a hat, I would love to tip it to you guys, but thanks so much for your time today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all. So this is part two. Please stay tuned. Part three will be on the way. We'll be talking about you've cl you're climbing the ladder. Not you can see the top right there. You've made it. How do you sustain it? What's important there? And then what's going to guide you into that next transition? But you got to come back when we drop that episode, right? So listen, um, I'll just ask Miriam if you could just share how they can get in contact you, with you real quick. Yes, ms.mimimorales at gmail.com. And Aisha? Yep, you can email me directly at Aisha at Aisha Ortiz Consulting.com. But you can also follow me on social media platforms under Aisha Ortiz Consulting. Absolutely. And listen, only serious inquiries, people. Don't do that. Yes, don't do that nonsense. Don't, don't waste time. <laughs> don't do, don't don't do that nonsense. Get busy. Don't waste time. <laughs> <laughs> So listen, we here at FCP want to thank you for tuning in for, to another great episode, and we want to thank our guests one more time. Make sure you go in the comments and check out the merchandise we got available. Don't forget to subscribe before you leave. I mean it. I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen, so we appreciate all y'all, but we got to go, right? Aisha and Miriam, they got to go be these great mentors, these great leaders that they are. And me and Kenny, we're just trying not to burn bridges with our wives. So we need to get out of here <laughs> and go attend to our families, right? So listen, you are now released back into your regularly scheduled programming. Corporate life, parental life, entrepreneurship, whatever it is that you do, we salute you. I'm Senor Lee. I'm Ken Catnick. See you back next day when we lock back in to a free state of mind. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>